The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now, for a moment, we're going to hear from a representative of our sponsor the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I look on my job as an Equitable Society representative as more than just a way of earning a living. It's a daily opportunity to do good turns for my friends and neighbors. Good turns like telling them about an equitable education fund so that their children are bound to get a good education no matter what happens. In approximately 14 minutes, I'll be back to give you the whole story of an equitable education fund, an important contribution to American education made by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Helpful Hobo. certain phrases which we Americans have made a part of our daily speech. Phrases which, because of their constant use, have acquired an aura of truth about them. Phrases like benevolent dictator and born criminal. Despite the public acceptance, though, the fact remains that there simply is no such thing as a born criminal. A child might be born to a pair of the most hardened criminals, and yet, if given the proper amount of affection and moral upbringing could grow up to become anything. A doctor, a minister of the clergy, or a prototype of his parents. Go to any maternity hospital at visiting hour any day and see the flock of newborn children. See how alike they are and how even the parents have trouble identifying their own baby from another. It is true that there are such things as young criminals, some children under the age of 10 having arrest records, But there are no infant criminals, nor any who are born to be. The basic characteristic of every criminal who breaks the law for profit is greed. Pure, unadulterated greed. And that is taught to a child, for children are not naturally greedy. There will be approximately three million children born in this country this year. And if those of you who are the parents of those children keep them ignorant of greed, then the crime wave of the future will have been dealt a potent blow, a blow from which it might never recover. Tonight's file opens at the city dump in a large eastern metropolis. Scattered about the dump are weather-beaten lean-tos that are obviously no match for the weather. In front of one of the shacks, a raggedly dressed man stands on a discarded kitchen chair. He's hammering a piece of tar paper over a hole in the wall as a well-dressed stranger approaches. Hey! Hey, you! Are you addressing me? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, want to talk to you. I'm occupied. Look, I got a job for you. There's Moo in it. Moo? Moo! Scratch! Money! Money? Yeah, mm. yeah, that's right. Mm. Oh. Well? Say, uh, you live here? Temporarily. You see, I'm between engagements. Huh? I'm of the theater. Oh, oh. Uh, conditions are a bit chaotic now. And in a transitory stage, you might say, television, you know. Yeah, yeah. For those of us with patients are sitting out its early stages. Yeah, I, I know. And I tried to bridge the waiting period by going to Hollywood. And I was highly successful there for a time until they discovered, to their horror and mine, the Technicolor brings out a pigmentation in my skin, which, when combined with the chemicals necessary uh, uh, to develop... Wait a the minute, will you? Wait a minute. Huh? Well, let's get down to business, will you? What business? Look, I'm looking for a friend of mine. Uh, he's a short guy. Uh, maybe five, six, skinny. Uh, and uh, he's got a bad left rock. Well, translate the latter part. Please. He limps real bad. Oh. Uh, have you seen him around here today? 
No. Well, you probably will. Now, uh, can you remember what he looks like? My good man, I am known as the quickest study that ever learned the Yeah, 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 yeah. Them. Now, look, uh, here's a double saw. D- double 20, saw. 20 bucks. Ooh. If and when you see the guy, yeah. I want you to call me. Uh, where? I'll give you my phone number. Oh. Just uh, ask for Joe here. Yeah. Oh, thank now, you. if you handle this right, peg the guy for me, I'll spot you another 50. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor has just entered the office of the agent in charge. You sent for me, Mr. Russell? Yes, Taylor. Have a seat. Thank you, sir. How's your desk? Pretty clean, sir. Good. I want you to go up to Fulton Falls this morning. To the prison? Yes, there's a patient in the prison hospital named George Humboldt. Interview him. All right, sir. Were you in the office when that case came in? Humboldt. Uh, no, sir. About three months ago, George Humboldt committed an armed robbery over in Madisonville. He escaped by stealing a car. I see. I have the details here. A Madisonville police car traced him to the state line, then notified the police here. Mm-hmm. Humboldt abandoned the car here in town, was picked up a few hours later. By that time, though, he'd gotten rid of the loot. Was it ever recovered, sir? No, that's why I want you to go up there, see if you can find out what he did with it. All right, sir. He got away with cash, negotiable bonds, and quite a bit of jewelry. You'll find the complete list in Humboldt's file. All right, sir, I'll read it before I go. Better take it with you and read it on the train. You see, there's a time element involved. Oh, what's that? I just got a call from the warden. Before the day is over, Humboldt may die. That you, Joe? Yeah. Where you been? Down the dump. The what? The city dump. Oh, what's playing there? Business. Remember that connection I made at the prison hospital? Uh-huh. He called me this morning. Oh, uh, what for? George Humble's in bad shape. He might kick over any minute. No kidding. The guy told me George's brother came to see him last night. Artie? Yeah. George told him where he buried the loot. How do you know? Our connection was on the area. Well, where is it? George said it was buried in the city dump. That's why I was down there. Oh, Joe, that's a big place. I know, I know. But if Artie shows up down there, we'll know about it. How? I got a dozen bums that live there looking for him. Uh, that'll be a good score if we make it, huh? Yeah, yeah, we'll make it. I insure the vet by sending Fat Willie up to Fulton Falls this morning. He's going to locate Artie and tail him as soon as he makes a move. Wait, I'll take it. Okay. Hello. Hello, sir. Is this Brookdale 9699? Yeah, that's right. Oh. Oh, that's me. Oh, good afternoon, my illustrious benefactor. How are you? This is Rodney Fairfield. Who? The roving player whose palm you crossed with silver this morning. Oh. For, for which act I'm most humbly grateful, sir. And I can assure you that your uh, direction... Get with it, Doc. Have you seen the guy I told you about? I'm uh, just coming to that. Oh. You know, I was resting comfortably this afternoon, taking in the warmth of the sun as it spent its precious few hours on ahead. Yeah. When, lo, I could scarcely believe these eyes... There was the gentleman you so fittingly described to me. You saw him? Oh, at this very moment, he is surveying the debris-laden paths which surround me humble abode. He's there now? And he was a few moments ago when I left to repair to this apothecary's to make this telephone call. Thanks. He's there. He's at the dump. Artie? Uh-huh. I'll see you later. <laughs> Mr. Russell? No, no. Come in, Taylor. Thank you. You're back pretty quickly, aren't you? Yes, sir. George Humboldt died shortly before I arrived. Oh, that's too bad. But we may still recover that stolen property, Mr. Russell. Oh, how? I learned that Humboldt has a brother who went to see him last night. Yeah? According to the visitor's registration book, the brother lived right near the prison. You think he has the loot? Well, no, sir, but there's a good chance he may know where it is. Why? Well, George Humboldt knew he was going to die. Oh? I learned that from the prison doctor. He talked to his brother at great length. Probably told him where the stuff was hidden. I think so. I decided to follow up on that. I went to where the brother lived. It turned out to be a rooming house. Uh, did you see him? No, sir. He'd checked out. I got that from his landlady. She told me that he'd left an early call, wanted to catch a train. I got a description of him, went to the railroad station, and the ticket clerk there remembered him. Did he remember his destination? Yes, sir. He came here. Well, 
It certainly makes it look like the loot is here, too. I would think so, sir. Oh, shall I ask the police to help us find him? Yes, call them immediately. Let me know of any developments. Hello? Hey, this is Joe. Oh, did you find Artie? Yeah. Well, he did Did he dig up the stuff? Not yet. Well, couldn't he find it? He didn't try. Oh, well, why not? He was just casing the joint. Oh, waiting for it to get dark, eh? Yeah, I guess so. Hey, hey Joe, did Fat Willie catch up to you? Yeah, he lost Artie when he got off the train. Well, where's Willie now? Across the street in the Central Hotel. We tail Artie there. That's where he's staying. Oh. oh. Well, look, come over here. We'll wait by the hotel as soon as Artie makes his move. We'll move right with him. Hold it, Pete. Well, what's the matter? Put out the flash. Why? We're getting closer to him. Oh. Yeah, walking through this stump in the dock ain't gonna be easy. You haven't it's worth it. Come on. Okay. Easy, easy, will you? I couldn't help it. Wait. What? Look ahead there. Artie stopped. Oh. Oh, looks like he's digging. Yeah, uh-huh. That must be where the stuff is buried. Yeah. Hey, come on. Wait a minute. Hmm? We'll wait till he comes up with it. What's that? Catch. Oh, I'll break that up. Just stay put. He stopped picking. He's reaching down for something. Can you see what it is? Yeah, it looks like a satchel. Oh, that must be the stuff. Huh? Uh-huh. Come on. Let's move in. Okay. Hello, Artie. Who was that? Us. Give me the satchel. Okay. Oh, shut up. Be on, Joe. Come on, turn on the flash. Right. He's not even locked. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, this is it. Okay, cash, bonds, jewelry. Oh, regular smuggler's boy. Yeah. Right? Well, let's get out of here. Joe, what do we do with him? We'll send Fat Willie in here. Have him take the guy and drop... Who's there? Down's the light. You hear me, gentlemen? Who are you? Oh, it's him. Who? The bummer gave me the tip on Artie. Just what sort of a... Oh, it's you, sir. Uh, greeting. Hiya. Oh, you gave me quite a start. I-, I saw your two faces in the glow of that pin spot, and I thought perhaps... Hello. What's this? Huh? With this chap on the ground. He's your missing friend, sir. That's right. What's happened to him? Look at his head. It's bleeding badly. Look, blow. Come on, boy. Oh, my dear fellow. Yeah, 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 just yeah, yeah, yeah. a moment. I shan't be dismissed as lightly, sir. I'm beginning to suspect foul play, skullduggery. Listen, you. You heard me, sir. I'm going to summon the minion of the law. <laughs> Let's get Fat Willie. Have him take both these stiffs away. <laughs> Turn to tonight's exciting FBI file in just a moment. Now that the 1949 college football season is in full swing, it's not hard to predict how millions of Americans will spend tomorrow afternoon. They'll be at the bowl or stadium or sticking close to the radio to enjoy a thrilling moment like this. Hold everything. It's not a touchdown. There's been a fumble. I think the blue fumble. Yes, Roberts fell on the ball. And there's the gun. What an ending. What a hero that boy will be in this college town tonight. Well, it's fine to be a football hero while you're in college. But that isn't the reason why loving parents save and make sacrifices to get their children educated. The real reason is that the odds in favor of a college man are 15 to 1. 
In other words, a college man is 15 times more likely to make a salary of $10,000 or more a year than a non-college man. Think that over, and I'm sure you'll understand why the Equitable Life Assurance Society attaches such great importance to its famous Equitable Education Fund. As its name indicates, an Equitable Education Fund is a simple, practical plan for parents who don't want to leave their children's education to chance. Chance is ruled out by an equitable education fund. It's sure. Right. This fund combines planned regular saving with life insurance. So if the father dies or becomes permanently disabled, this plan makes certain that his children will still be able to get the education he was ambitious for them to have. Second advantage, an equitable education fund is easy. It spreads the cost of college over 12 or 15 years. On that basis... It is surprising how small a monthly payment is required to build up a sum that is ample to see a boy or girl through college. Remember, higher education and higher salaries go hand in hand. So the more truly you love your children, the more determined you will be to give them a head start toward future success and happiness with an equitable education fund. Get in touch with your equitable society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Helpful Hobo. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI presents you with a perfect picture of the essence of the criminal and of his parasitic existence. He considers himself a success only if he lives off the toil of someone else. And to him, one dishonest dollar is worth two of the other kind. Therefore, the situation depicted in this case is his constant ambition. For here, he is able to gather in the spoils of a robbery without even having to go to the trouble of planning and committing that crime. The fact that murder is involved is not even a temporary deterrent. For the true criminal is so complete an egomaniac that he considers the possibility of his being caught to be minute. Yes, he knows that others are apprehended by the police. He might even know that at the time of the last census in this country, there were more than 175,000 people in prison. But he is not bothered by facts like that because it is more pleasant to listen to his ego. His ego, which tells him that those people were caught because they got careless or because they were stupid. And so he vows to himself that he will not be careless and he will not be stupid. And that satisfies him. Satisfies him enough so that he believes he can go on lying, stealing, cheating, yes, and even killing until the very end. Next file continues in the office of Agent in Charge Russell. Special Agent Taylor has just entered. Good morning, Taylor. Morning, sir. Any word come in on young Humboldt? Yes, sir, just now. Good. Oh, not so good, sir. What do you mean? There was an automobile accident on Front Street last night near Pier 51. Yes? According to the police report, the car swerved to avoid a truck and ran into the side of the pier. The driver got away. Was that Humboldt? No, sir. He and another man were in the back seat, and uh, Humboldt was dead. Well. According to the coroner, sir, he was dead before the accident. Before? Oh. Hmm. What was the cause of death? A blow on the head that fractured his skull. What about the car? I checked the motor number. It was stolen last night from a street near the city dump. Oh, uh, Iden is working now on some fingerprints that I got off the steering wheel. Good. Who was the other man in the car with Humboldt? His name is Rodney Fairfield, sir. He was taken to city hospital unconscious. He's still in no condition to be interviewed. Did the hospital say when you could see him? Yes, sir. I spoke to them about ten minutes ago. I'll be able to talk to him early this afternoon. Good. See him as soon as possible. Then report back to me. <laughs> the stiffs. He left them. Did? Well, the old bum was still alive. Where is he? City Hospital. I, uh, I called that. (laughs) That's bad. Joe, he'll talk. 
Yeah, he loves to. Uh, you think we can get into the hospital? That's an idea. You want to try? We might have to. Get up here real quick. Fairfield, you say this Joe wrote down a phone number where he could be reached? That is correct, sir. But you lost the paper. Unfortunately, yes. Well, can you by any chance recall the number? Shocking as it may seem to you, no. Well, then I'd like to review just one point with you, uh, please. Go right ahead, sir. Delighted to cooperate. Well, now, you say that you, uh, you talked to this man called Joe during the day. I did, sir. He... He approached me quarter, seeking aid. At the time, of course, I had no inkling of his villainous intent. Yes, I, I know. Uh, now, you say you also saw this man again last night. Saw him? My dear fellow, he bludgeoned me. He and his vile companion. I knew, sir. I knew the moment I saw their evil faces. Mr. Fairfield. These uh, were... <laughs> Mr. Fairfield. Uh, why, after seeing this Joe twice in one day, can't you tell me what he looks like? Uh, sir... May I intrude into your personal life long enough to ask you just one question, please? Why, certainly. Yeah. Have you... Have you ever trod the boards? You mean have I ever been an actor? Precisely. Well, I did some acting while I was in college. Amateur? Yes. I loathe them. Oh. Is that why you ask me about my acting experience? No, no. I'm, I'm attempting to explain... Why I am unable to give you an adequate description of my assailant. Oh, now, in the theater, uh, the professional theater, when playing a scene with someone, you seldom look at a fellow actor's face. You look over his head. That gives you greater stature and also hides any tendency toward the double chin. Oh, I see. Naturally, after my years in the theater, I address everyone in that manner. Well, then all you can tell me is that his first name is Joe and that he's about five feet ten. Yes, sir. Oh. Here's a pitcher of fresh water, Mr. Fairfield. Oh, thank you, Miss Fairwell. Oh, miss. Yes, sir? How could I find out whether or not anyone has called the hospital here asking about Mr. Fairfield? The switchboard keeps a record of those calls. Where is that? Down the hall to your left, as far as you can go. Oh, thanks very much. I'll be right back, Mr. Fairfield. Oh, splendid. And if I'm right about something, we may be able to catch these men without a description. <laughs> I'm in here. You ready? Uh, for what? To get to the hospital. That's out. Why? It's too risky. Oh, are we going to take it on the Duffy? Well, it depends. On what? Whether the old bum is still alive. Hey, what's that number of the hospital? Uh, bridge 1110. Maybe the old bum is dead by now. Well, huh? That'll fix everything up. Uh, will he say where he was? Yeah, he's in Madisonville. He's got a friend. Hey, of the hold, hold it. Look, I, I'd like to find out how a friend of mine is. Yes, sir. What is the patient's name, please? Rodney Fairfield. Thank you. I will check. He's checking. Uh -huh. Hey, like I was saying, Joe, Fat Willie's with a friend who's got a saloon there. Willie's going to be a Did you say Rodney oh, well, Fairfield, uh, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Fairfield is no longer a patient. My file shows Mr. Fairfield was released at 318 this afternoon. Oh. Okay. Thanks, miss. Well, we get another chance, Pete. Why? They sprung from the hospital a half hour ago. Yeah? Let's pay the old bum a visit. Okay. And this time... We do the job right. Throw on the flashlight, Pete. Come on. Okay. Uh, I don't know how we got through this stuff last night. Mm. Me, me neither. Huh? Hey, you uh, see the old. Bum yet? No, no, but he's down around here somewhere. Yeah, they must have dumped a lot of this today. Yeah. Hold it, Pete. Hmm? There's the joint. Oh, yeah. And there's the guy. Hi there. Who is it? Uh, Joe. You braggart. You the nerve to return here to the scene of your villainous treachery? Hold it. Let's just go inside the shack. Mm -hmm. What for? We want to talk to you. My home is my castle. 
And I invite in those whom I choose. Well, look, we come down to tell you we're sorry about last night. Yeah, it was an accident. Your apologies are not acceptable. We didn't only come for that. Oh. Perhaps you wish to autograph this bandage on my head, eh? That is, if either of you can write. Joe, it ain't gonna work this way. No, I guess not. Let's try this. <laughs> Just a moment, sir. You put that gun away. <laughs> you heard him drop it. Huh? Drop it! Oh. Well, you timed your entrance magnificently, Mr. Taylor. This gentleman is a special agent of the FBI. Mr. Fairfield. And from what I understand... That's all right, Mr. Fairfield. We can explain the rest of it to them on the way to headquarters. The arrest of the three criminals solved 14 large robberies where the funds were transported over state lines. Although guilty of federal crimes, the three were turned over to state authorities on murder charges, convicted and executed. Special Agent Taylor was able to bring tonight's case from the files of your FBI to a successful conclusion by having the city hospital release Rodney Fairfield temporarily so that he could act as a decoy and bring the criminals back to the city dump. That was necessary because, as you have heard, your FBI had no description or leads on either of the old man's assailants. Fingerprints found on the steering wheel of the car in which Fat Willie Johnson was transporting Fairfield and the dead Artie Humboldt to Johnson's identification and to his subsequent arrest. And so all three members of the gang were rounded up and ultimately removed from circulation. Removed by conviction in a court of law. Convictions which formed a part of the record compiled by the Federal Bureau of Investigation this year. That record shows that more than 97% of all people arrested by your FBI were later convicted, a mark which proves how thorough every special agent is in gathering evidence, in doing his job of protecting the life and property of you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first, let's hear briefly from an Equitable Society representative on the subject of an equitable education fund. Many families go heavily into debt to send a boy or girl through college. Don't let this happen to you. Start an Equitable Education Fund soon, and the money will be ready and waiting when your youngster is ready for college. The man whose words you have just heard speaks for nearly 8,000 Equitable Society representatives from coast to coast who are always ready to give you friendly help and counsel. If you do not know the name of the Equitable Man in your community, send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a file exposing the operations of a family of thieves. Its subject, arson. Its title, The Unhappy Firebug. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Grace Albertson, Edgar Barrier, Hans Conried, Peter Leeds, and Mark Lawrence. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Unhappy Firebug on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.